well, this is your show. You should guide this thing, shouldn't you? I do. I want to bring up, we need to talk about Lynn Rossi. So, but it's your show. We can do whatever you want. Well, why don't we start with that? Because that was something we didn't get a chance to talk about on the experience, but he is an important figure in Southern wrestling and he just passed away. A long, healthy life, 90 years old. Let's talk a little bit about Lynn Rossi. I think, was he 91? Was he 91? Okay. He may have been, uh, he may have been 91, but anyway, um, and of course, a lot of people by this point, because he's been retired for almost 50 years, were saying, well, who? And if they, you know, bothered to read the stories, they would know, have some semblance of knowledge of how important he was, um, because a number of the, uh, the major wrestling sites did uh, capsule, you know, encapsulations of his career and memoriam, et cetera. But um, it's hard to explain to modern fans how important this guy was to one specific territory, the Tennessee territory, for so long a period of time. And yet most people have never heard of him, even they know Jackie Fargo, but they don't know Lynn Rossi. Well, because Fargo, uh, through, you know, not only luck, because as, as we all know, Lynn's career was ended early by a car wreck, uh, but the, Fargo was the more colorful guy. Fargo was always, I look at it like this way. If you had to draw a, a more modern analogy, the way that Lynn Rossi and Jackie Fargo coexisted in the Tennessee Territory if Jackie Fargo was Dusty Rhodes and Lynn Rossi was Jack Briscoe in Florida, and for a few more modern fans, uh, I don't know if there is a more modern I- equivalent, but Lynn Rossi was the baby face, the wrestler. He was a real good athlete. He was a legitimate uh, amateur wrestler, and and he was he was the scientific, as they used to call the baby faces in the old days, the scientific wrestler. He didn't break the rules. He followed the science of wrestling. And he was fucking great. The drop kicks and the flying head scissors and he could wrestle on the mat. And, and he was a pure white meat baby face, you know, g- good body and athletic, but humble and soft spoken, you know, Italian. But the people knew that he had moved to Nashville and and, uh, you know, made it his home for so many years. So he was the hometown guy, whereas he had never been a heel. Fargo came in as one of the Fargo brothers and they'd gotten over instantly because of their gimmick and their color and their personality and they could work, but in a whole different way. Fargo was the, he was dusty. He was a guy who, who, you know, he was the brawler. He used furniture. He fucking, you know, cut the promo. He didn't exchange wrist locks and flying head scissors. And Fargo became a baby face in the territory by being a heel for so long that, but finally he grew on people. And then like a Steve Austin, as we've drawn the comparison, the people really switched him. And so then the bookers went ahead and switched him and he never was a wrestler wrestler, but he had all the color. So, you know, he was the, he was the entertainment, but Rossi was more important to Nick Goulas's promotion on in the office than Fargo ever was. Fargo was the top guy. He was the main event star. And he always, I think, even though Rossi was so consistent for so many years, Fargo was still the, the box office attraction, but Rossi often would book for Nick. And I don't think that far, I don't think Fargo ever wanted to book. I don't think they ever let him book. I'm sure he probably booked a bunch of shit for himself <clears throat> and being the, the top guy. You could do that. But Rossi was always the faithful guy, and that's why when um, the the split happened between Jarrett and and Nick Goulas, even though Rossi was mostly retired at that point because the car wreck had happened at the end of 72, Lynn Rossi was never a big deal in Jerry Jarrett's towns. Um, Fargo was. Even before Jarrett split from Goulas, when Jarrett broke off and and established the 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 you know uh, the uh, didn't break off but it opened up Louisville and Evansville Indiana and and was booking Memphis and that ended up becoming a separate territory we've talked about this on the program in the late 60s early 70s the Tennessee territory under Nick Goulas was so big had so many weekly towns they actually had two territories in one Lynn Rossi never went to Memphis because it was on Monday nights, and that was where when Birmingham ran. 
And he was the undisputed, you know, top most popular guy in Birmingham. And that was Nick's town. Roy Welch and later Jerry Jarrett ran Memphis, and that was their town. And Jarrett had been a fan of Fargo's, and Fargo had been most over in Memphis among all those years. So it just, it happened that way. Anyway, Fargo and Rossi, as you've talked about, and Brian, you can come in on this, Fargo and Rossi didn't really get along because of that rivalry and both of them really being the top guy and being such different kind of people to begin with. But, you know, at the same time, Rossi was, was a, a more important office guy. He later on, he did commentary for Nick after his wreck, even though he wasn't real, real, real good at it, but it was because of his name. Wasn't he and Nick's he, booker too? And, and like, yeah, he, he booked off. He booked when he was still in the, in the business booked, you know, Nick's in the towns like Birmingham and Chattanooga that often had separate programs running than the Northern towns are over in Memphis. So, but there was that rivalry between him and Fargo. They never really had a lot of good things to say about each other. You had, as a matter of fact, you've talked to Lynn Rossi more than I have in the last 45 years. I met him as a fan and got his autograph. You actually had him on your show. I had him on 605 uh, probably two, three years ago. And it was a really good interview. I believe I was right after Mario Milano died. Because Mario Milano, before he became one of the all-time legends of Australian wrestling, Worked in Tennessee. Yeah, it was huge. Big baby face. Yeah. And he had teamed with Len Rossi. So we talked a little bit about that and then a little bit about other things. And I guess I could reveal it now. While the interview isn't necessarily in kayfabe, there were certain things he wasn't going to talk about. And there's certain things I knew not to ask him. Right. I knew I couldn't make any pointed questions that would reveal that the business was a work. He wasn't going to do that still. That old school, like Bruno, you know, they'll talk. And they'll loosen up on certain things over the years, but they still won't come out and just flat out say, this is right. what was going on. But after the interview ended, we talked for a few minutes and he apologized and he explained that. And I said, I completely understand. That's what I expected. And that's why I didn't ask you certain things. And then he proceeded to say, <laughs> I should say, he proceeded to say what he really felt about Nick pushing George Goulas. Oh boy. But he didn't want to say it on the air. But, you know, he thought that was a big problem, that that really did hurt Nick. And he was just a really nice guy, and he was really with it. I mean, I, I hope when I'm in my late 80s, I'm as with it as he was. He obviously changed his life around after the car crash. A few years later, he got into organic food and healthy food. He opened up his health food store in Tennessee. Yeah, as a matter of fact, that was, back then, there were really not really such things as health food stores. Um, he said after 20 years of wrestling and, and almost 15 years being a top guy in Tennessee. And like we said, booking for Nick and, and, you know, being a, a top star, he has the car wreck. He can't wrestle anymore. He started drinking and was depressed. And then I can't even remember what the happenstance was that led somebody to mention, Hey, you could change. No, he got, um, some kind of didn't he get uh, to the hospital? He got sick, diverticulitis, or some yeah. kind of stomach issue. And the doctor said you can cure this. And he got into eating healthy and naturally. His ankle, basically, his uh, several parts of his body, but his ankle was really bad, fucked up to where he couldn't. He tried to work some when Joey, his son, turned pro, and Joey was not. Let's <laughs> put he didn't look or work anything like Lynn. Sorry to say, but. uh but he really stayed in great shape. And that's why he was, like I said, he was 91. He and Cowboy Bob Ellis, who would have thought this years ago, were the oldest two major wrestling stars left. Um, but yeah, that health food store, he operated it until just a few years ago when the city ran him out of the building on a construction project. And he started selling stuff out of his garage at home. But that that business, he'd been in twice as long or more as he was in wrestling at that point. And everybody in town knew him. And, you know, he, he was a real nice guy. It just that was the thing. You you can't have baby faces like him anymore because he was literally a legitimately nice guy and came off just like Lynn Rossi on TV. He was being himself, except he wasn't saying wrestling was a work. 
And now everybody, baby face, heel, whatever, has to be crazy. But but he was legitimate because he had started training and wrestling when he was a teenager and did shoot fighting against adults. Well, not shoot fighting, but shoot matches, wrestling matches and the, oh, those smokers of the amateur club fights. So he really knew what he was doing so the people could believe that. But at the same time, he just, all he had to do was be himself. And that's why they picked him to be with Bearcat Brown, I think. <clears throat> because um, Jarrett was fiddling around with it um, in his booking, uh, Bearcat Brown and Johnny Walker, before he Bearcat teamed up with Lynn Rossi, had been a team uh, briefly, but they put Bearcat Brown and Lynn Rossi together as the first mixed, integrated, however they sold it, uh, black and white tag team in the Tennessee area, which took in Birmingham, Alabama as well, which was a hot spot in those days. And this was 1969. But it worked because the black people loved Bearcat Brown and everybody loved Lynn Rossi. And if Lynn was teaming with Bearcat, well, then it had to be okay. And so there was no fucking problem. But then they did the angle in, in Birmingham where the interns and Ken Ramey painted Bearcat Brown white on Birmingham television. And they sold out the Boutwell Auditorium weeks and weeks in a row on that program. And of course, you couldn't do anywhere, anything anywhere near that today. But nobody was mad at the promotion. There were no calls to take wrestling off the air. The building didn't kick them out. Obviously, they were selling out every week. 6,000 people. Um, the heels got the heat. And, and as, as I recall, after that program, they sent the interns out of the territory because they were worried about them. But it, at the same time, that's what made... And then they took it... That was... Um, Lynn and, and Bearcat were uh, and were an early babyface team here when Jared opened up Louisville, which it wasn't quite as odd here as it was in Birmingham, but it still hadn't been done because Louisville had been dark since the early, since before the Civil Rights Movement. Fucking uh, the Civil Rights Act was signed. Um, but all over the territory, they, you know, they did that and they were huge as a fucking team. And they had a couple year run before his wreck. But it was it was big business. When you were going to ask a question, when I was going to say when Len died, I went and looked through the archives and I found my Len Rossi folder. Uh, you know, again, this is the archives that are from Wrestling News, Wrestling Review, Ring Wrestling. I think this would be from Ring Wrestling and maybe from Wrestling Review. I'm not sure, but I found a photo I'd never seen before. It is Len Rossi and Bearcat Brown embracing, hugging each other in the ring while the fans are just jumping up and down around them. I think it's in Birmingham. Yes, that I've, it's, it's a famous picture. It is in Birmingham. The people are up on the apron of the ring, kind of, right? Trying to reach up to them, and they're hugging each other and all after a match. It's such a beautiful photo, and I had never seen it. And I just said, wow, this really says so much. And by the way, most of that crowd there is white, from what you yeah. can see. And it's a pretty big thing. You know, we talk about Sputnik Monroe and whatever... You know, whatever he did, whatever Roy Welch did, but the African-American fans were allowed to attend wrestling shows because of Sputnik Monroe in Memphis. And then you look at this. just But a black guy wasn't allowed to wrestle a white guy yet. Or team with him. Or team with him. And then actually they they worked it in. They they even did a gradual thing because they that's why Nick used to love to bring in those Japanese heels, I think. They they worked a deal where where Bearcat Brown and a black partner worked against the Japanese heels first, just to kind of feel that they were going by shades at that point, right? It was insane. And you know, you bring up the heat between Len and Jared and his crew, for lack of a better term, but you yeah. know, Jackie Fargo. But you know, one of the infamous incidents, it took place in Louisville. There was a match that turned into a shoot between Dandy Jack Donovan and Tojo Yamamoto, where Dandy Jack ended up, because of whatever Tojo was doing to him, going for Tojo's eye. And then there was an incident a few days later in Nashville at the TV taping where they were going to do promos, where allegedly Dandy Jack Donovan was... This jumped. has never been proven. <laughs> it's never been proven, but that's where I'm going with this. Dandy Jack Donovan was jumped 
by Tojo and Jerry Jarrett and Jackie Fargo and beaten so badly specifically with Tojo's wooden shoe. This is not on camera for anyone confused as I'm telling this, that he ended up leaving the wrestling business. I mean, that was the end of Dandy Jack Donovan. Yeah. Len Rossi, Dandy Jack Donovan told the story in Scott Teal's Whatever Happened to in the 90s. And then I believe the next issue, a letter appeared from Len and Joey Rossi, which I kind of think going back to what I said earlier, Joey probably wrote it knowing his father didn't want to truly expose everything, but his father gave the okay to attach his name to it. And they said, we were there. We witnessed the whole thing. We saw the whole thing happen. And, you know, again, there was a lot of heat between Len, who was the biggest star and the booker for the Birmingham end, and Jerry Jarrett, who was Louisville, Memphis, and, you know, that, that heat, I don't think ever went away. No, and uh, I think at the, because Lynn would have been running, see, here's the thing, since it was all in the same company technically at that point, Goulas Welch Enterprises, even though there were two ends of the territory, everybody did local promos at the TV studio in Nashville on Wednesday morning, and Louisville was on Tuesday night, so it makes sense it's the next day. Also, it's the next day, yeah, yeah. Yeah, whatever, and Lynn Rossi would have been the one running the, interviews as far as okay you got to talk for evansville and you got to talk for bowling green or whatever because he was booking uh even though Jarrett booked his own things and did his own stuff in memphis and etc so the point is whatever happened between jack donovan and tojo and tojo didn't have he had a reputation for being fucking a, a bad person to cross if you fucked with him but he didn't have a reputation for being unprofessional in front of the fans and everybody, each one of them had their story. Um, Jack Donovan thought that he was being disrespected and beaten up, blah, 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 whatever the fuck. But Donovan goes for Tojo's eye. Well, that, that, that was it at that point, because Fargo, Tojo and Jarrett, that was the nucleus of the Memphis crew, which at the time was the big fucking city. And Jack Donovan's a heel. It's traveling through. So they were going to fuck him up <laughs> no matter what happened. Uh, Lynn Rossi probably didn't appreciate it, not only because they got a lot of blood all over the fucking bathroom in the uh, TV studio in Nashville, and that's never a good thing for your television relations, but also because there was, you know, the, the, the tension elsewhere. I'll tell you, too, thinking about that and thinking about whatever did happen, I don't think anyone could dispute that Jerry Jarrett and Tojo and Fargo were in cahoots and whatever happened, they were together. It really makes you think about how hurt Jared must have been when he finally in 77 went off on his own and Fargo and Tojo don't go with him. They stay with Nick. Yeah. Well, it, and they turned out that they made a, a grievous error in judgment. But they, at the time, I, th I think there was a, probably a thing where they'd worked for Nick for fucking 20 years at that point. And there was some loyalty, but also... I think they thought that, you know, Jerry might be fucking up with doing this, starting on his own like that. And, and they didn't want to, at that point in their career, you know, choose the wrong side. And within a short period of time, they had realized that the worm had turned. But, but Jackie didn't come back for two years. And how long, how long was Tojo? It was about the same amount of time. Jared kept him out for a couple of years to just make the point. Had Fargo been back? I guess he would have before you did that interview with him before you were in the, when you were just a photographer. Oh yeah. No. Remember they came back in 79. Yeah. And you gave him the wrestler of the decade award in like 1981. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, we, we were, <laughs> we were forward looking at the point. We were, who's going to fucking time? No, it was for the previous decade. Truthfully. That's the way it was presented. I don't know if I got that out or not, but it was for the previous decade. Another thing I think it's important to point out, you brought up Joey earlier is just how much his son Joey meant to him. And I know that when I talked to him a few years ago, which was several years after Joey had passed, I think it was cancer, yeah. it still really affected him. And he was really, he told me after the call how thankful he was that we got to talk a little bit about him and just make sure that he was brought up. And it's still, you know, obviously anyone loves their son, but it was a very special relationship between Joey and Len. Yeah, and, and, that was, and I think it was probably for the best that... <laughs> that Joey did not try to pursue wrestling any longer than he did. Um, 
you know, even though obviously we're growing up and your father's that big of a deal, you want to do what he did. And, the, you know, everybody else in Tennessee, their children would carry on the name, but it, 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 he wasn't good at it. He wasn't it, the athlete that Lynn was. And he, and it, it was to the point every once in a while, the first few years where the fans were like, eh, whatever the, his match came on, it was, you know, and, and then, but then I guess he got into uh, some type of, local politics or uh, representatives or something Joey did for a career, actually. I remember seeing that somewhere. I don't know. And, you know, just, again, a remarkable career. Len Rossi, an Italian guy from the Northeast, becomes the biggest baby face in Tennessee and Alabama. It really <laughs> is pretty remarkable. Well, see, we were the Southern people wrestling could could break down stereotypes here down south, for heaven's sake. <clears throat> but anyway, yeah, I, you know, it's it's a shame, but um, but yeah, uh, Lynn ended up being in the health food business more than twice as long as he was in the wrestling business and living to ninety one. That's amazing, and you know, because he took a lot of bumps over that time. But that showed those guys, you know, it, it, it used to guys that have 20 year careers if they, or more. And if they retired early, it was because of car wrecks and shit. Now everybody's retiring early because the shit they're doing to themselves in the ring. <laughs>